I've never actually done this before. Let's see what happens. Two, three, I'll go for three. Well, that made a mess. How about I talk about exactly what happened here inside where it's not quite so hot and uh, sticky. Carbonation happens when carbon dioxide dissolves in water to make carbonic acid. And it does this through pressure. Reason number 1001 why pressure changes everything. Now there's a couple of different ways of doing this. You know, for thousands of years, beer makers would add sugar and yeast into a sealed container. The yeast would eat the sugar, make carbon dioxide, and with no place to go, the pressure builds up and eventually dissolves into the water. This can go badly. But today, soda companies add fizz to drinks by just injecting carbon dioxide into water and pressurizing it. To get a little nerdier, the chemical reaction looks like this. H2O plus CO2 produces H2CO3 in a dynamic equilibrium. The dynamic equilibrium part means that the reaction can go left to right or go right to left. Add pressure, and the reaction goes to the right. Release that pressure, and the process reverses. So when you open a soda can, that sound is the sound of water and CO2 breaking up. Still a better love story than Twilight. That's the sound of water crying. But why does Mentos make it all so explosive? Well, the theory is that the surface of the Mentos is rough, and that rough surface then kind of creates millions of little spots where the water and CO2 can break apart. And because they're heavy, they sink down to the bottom, allowing more of the surface to be in contact with the water, and it just kind of accelerates everything. Now, this is just a fun little science experiment that just kind of helps teach how, you know, soda works, but mostly it's just fun to blow stuff up. But it turns out this can also happen in nature on a massive scale. And this is not quite so fun. Late in the evening of August 15th, 1984, an explosion rocked the residents of the village of Mindown in Cameroon. They told police the next morning that the sound had come from the direction of Lake Manown, five kilometers to the south. A policeman went to the lake to investigate and he brought a doctor along with him, just in case anybody was hurt. Uh, and before they even reached the lake, they came across a strange cloud. They say it looked like pale smoke and just kind of hovered near the ground, uh, only reaching about three meters in height. But before they got a chance to really even investigate it, they both started kind of feeling sick, so they had to get out of there. Once that cloud dispersed, they came back to the area and discovered that whatever that cloud was, it killed everything. Strewn all over the place were the bodies of animals and birds and 37 people. All of them asphyxiated, and many had strange blisters all over their skin. The investigators were baffled. There was a flattened vegetation around the lake that suggested a five meter high wave had crashed at the shore, and there were sulfurous odors in the area. As time went on and no answers were found, rumors started to spread that the deaths had been deliberate. Maybe some kind of biological weapon. This, of course, got the attention of the U.S. government because weapons, <laughs> that's our thing. So they asked Professor Harold or Sigurdsson to investigate. Uh, he is not only the most Icelandic sounding human being alive, he's also an expert volcanologist and geochemist which, being from Iceland, only makes sense. 
In fact, I think he popped up in my Super Volcanoes video. And he's the right person for the job because Lake Manoon was actually created by a volcanic eruption way, way back in the day. And it's actually one of 38 lakes that lie on a chain of volcanoes called the Cameroon Line. So as part of his investigation, he went around, he interviewed locals, and he went out on the lake on a boat to get some samples. Yeah, it turned out finding the right spot was actually pretty easy because there were still bubbles coming up to the surface. And what he figured out was that these bubbles were carbon dioxide. The lake had become saturated with it, and these bubbles were just like literally the lake fizzing like a carbonated soda. Only something caused this to erupt. Something was the, the Mentos that caused this lake to explode. And in the process, it released so much carbon dioxide gas that literally everything and everyone in the area choked to death. And after two years of studying this eruption, Harold Ehr published his theory and gave the phenomenon a name, limnic eruptions. So the obvious question here is how exactly does a lake get saturated with CO2? How do you carbonate a lake? Well, it's the same with the beer and the soda examples earlier. You add pressure. And it turns out an easy way to add more pressure is to just add more water. If a lake is deep enough, and the water at the bottom will be under so much pressure from the weight of the water above that the water will bond with carbon dioxide, just like in soda. Now, most lakes absorb CO2 from the air, but since the source of the CO2 is at the top where the pressure is low, it doesn't become carbonated. So for that water down at the bottom to become saturated, there has to be some source of carbon dioxide way down at the bottom of the lake. And there are two sources that fit that bill, volcanic gas vents and decomposing plant or animal matter, both of which also create methane, which can also dissolve under pressure. And what happens to lake water when it combines with CO2 or methane at that kind of depth? Well, nothing, actually, so long as the pressure stays high. But if the pressure drops... Pressure. Imagine 50 billion Mentos falling into 100 billion liters of Diet Coke. This is a phenomenon that Harold and Sigurdsson called Lake Overturn. And Lake Manown is not the only lake that's experienced this, or the deadliest. Actually, not even close. Literally two months after Harold R. Sigurdsson published his findings, a second event occurred, only 100 kilometers away, this one at Lake Nyos. Around 9 p.m. on August 21st, 1986, people living near the lake heard a rumble, and a wind caused some people to pass out. The next day, investigators found the lake transformed. The blue waters had actually turned red from iron being dredged up from the depths. They found that a massive wave had struck portions of the lake shore, with waves cresting as high as 100 meters in some places. In fact, it damaged the contours of the lake so much that it dried out a waterfall. But far more disturbing was the death around the lake. It, it wiped out literally everything. Eyewitnesses would later describe a chilling silence in the area. There were no bird calls, no animals moving around, not even any bugs. I think the creepiest detail that I came across in the eyewitness reports was uh, the absence of flies. Like, dead bodies were all over the place, but none of them had any flies on them. Because even the flies were dead. The human death toll in the end of this thing came to 1,746 people. This was a massive disaster, and it brought a whole lot more experts to Cameroon. They found blisters on the bodies, just like they did at Lake Manoon, and this led some people to believe that maybe a volcano had erupted. Um, but volcanoes... Let's just say they aren't quite so subtle. Yeah, volcanic eruptions throw out huge amounts of rock and ash, and they create lava flows, and they release sulfur into the air. Now, you might remember that they reported the smell of sulfur at Lake Manoon. Well, it was also smelled by NIO survivors, but when investigators went to go, you know, find evidence of it, they couldn't find any elevated sulfur levels anywhere. The water was also too cool for it to have been a volcanic eruption. Um, investigators said that if it was a volcanic eruption, it would have been at least 40 degrees Celsius warmer. It was pretty clear that the CO2 level was the culprit for the deaths. In fact, one of the key investigators was a guy named George Kling. Um, he actually took a sample of the Lake Nyos water and said it literally exploded from its container. But there were still some major questions about this. Number one would be the smell. CO2 doesn't smell like sulfur. Now, on the other hand, it has been known to trigger sensory hallucinations, so maybe the sulfurous odor was just an illusion. Or maybe the survivors did smell sulfur, but it was at such low doses it didn't leave any trace amounts behind. And then there was the blisters on all the people's skin. Um, one theory was that it wasn't carbon dioxide, but carbon monoxide that did that. That's been known to cause blisters uh, by limiting the circulation of blood in people's skin. Or they could have been caused by trace amounts of some other toxic gases that are mixed in with the CO2. Which kind of leaves just the one big question, which is, why did these lakes erupt? What caused this pressure drop that set everything in motion? Lake Manoon and Lake Nyo seem to have been accumulating gases for quite some time. Uh, both have thought to have been fed by soda springs that carry gases from deep underground. One theory was that a landslide might have broken the lake seal, or a volcanic eruption that was just kind of too small to leave direct signs. 
Now, both disasters occur during monsoon season. So George Kling has a theory that, that maybe just the, the colder rainwater uh, after a rainstorm may have cooled the water just enough to allow the deep water to rise, which would lower the pressure. Kaboom. I think it's also interesting that both of these took place around the equator, where the temperature doesn't really fluctuate that much throughout the year, so it might have been able to you know, contain all this CO2 for so long because there weren't any temperature changes that would have caused that pressure to drop. The fact is we may never know what exactly caused these two eruptions, but we do know the most important thing, how to prevent them in the future. In 1990, a team of engineers added plumbing to the exploding lakes. Um, there were money problems at first, it took a little while to get going, but they basically installed artificial fountains to let the gassy water erupt from the depths. And Nios was so saturated that the fountain shot up 45 meters high. At first, it's gone down since then, which is good, that means it's working. And yeah, thanks to these efforts, Lake Manun and Lake Nios are now considered safe. But, in the words of the great Master Yoda, there is another. About 2,000 kilometers west of Lake Manun lies Lake Kivu. Kivu is not only much larger and considerably deeper than these two lakes, but it's also sitting on top of volcanic vents that have been releasing gas into it for thousands of years. Yeah, they estimated in 2021 that the amount of CO2 in Lake Kivu equals as much as 5% of global CO2 emissions. It's in one lake. So yeah, if Lake Kivu exploded, it would be bad for, like, everyone. But for the people nearby, it would be an absolute disaster. Actually, no, Lake Nios was a disaster, and that was with a population of 14,000 people living around it. Lake Kivu sits on the border of Rwanda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and there are nearly 2 million people living around it. And as if that wasn't enough, it's also bordered by an active volcano, Mount Niryagongo, which actually erupted in May 2021. Like, half a million people had to evacuate. Luckily, Kivu didn't explode. Actually, the size of Kivu might be its saving grace. It's just so big and heavy, it can kind of keep that pressurized gas trapped down there. But don't relax too much, because it also contains a huge amount of methane down there, which is more prone to overturn. Now, the upside to methane is that it's a natural gas, so people are incentivized to get it out of the lake, because then you can sell that. And that's exactly what's happening. In 2015, a new power plant came online called Kivuwatt that's currently delivering 26 megawatts of electricity to the Rwandan power grid. I mean, talk about a win-win. Of course, every rose has its thorn. Uh, some experts are concerned that the methane extraction might actually destroy the layer of dense water that keeps the gases trapped. And if that doesn't trigger an explosion directly, it might make the lake more sensitive to other triggers, like Mount Niirigongo. Now, on top of that, many locals actually make their living off of the lake in the fishing industry, and they're concerned that the methane extraction could stir up toxic chemicals that could make that a problem. Now, to be fair, the Rwandan government is monitoring the water situation, and so far, so good. But Kivuwat isn't a perfect solution. At their current rate, they'll extract less than 5% of the lake's methane in 25 years. Plans to expand have been in place, but they've moved really slowly. Of course, they kind of have to. Lake Kivu is literally a time bomb. Only difference is, with a time bomb, at least you know how much time you have. So next time you crack open a soda, just remember, you're flirting with some dangerous chemistry. Mm. Don't get me started on the sugar, it's bad for you. It's so bad for you. But if you find chemistry scary, don't worry, little buddy. Brilliance got you covered with their chemical reactions course. In this course, you'll learn the fundamentals of chemistry by learning how reactions occur. And you'll do it through 15 interactive quizzes and puzzles to see how change, energy, and probability combine to determine the basic behavior of molecules interacting with other molecules. You'll get a handle on acids and bases, ions and charge, moles and collision theory, and much more. And you'll do it in a way that's way more fun than high school chemistry class, which I practically needed a pillow to get through. But of course, this is just one of dozens of courses on Brilliant, where you can learn everything from algebra and calculus, which was also nap time for me in high school, to astronomy, solar energy, basic physics, all the way up to neural net, statistical probability, you name it. You can go as basic or advanced as you want, and it's a lot of fun. It's especially fun if you struggle with a subject in school, because this is just a whole different kind of learning. You know, it, it should actually be called brain hacking, because it's just so much different than traditional learning. So if you want to get a taste of that brilliant magic, you can do the first couple of lessons for free on any of their courses if you sign up at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. And if you like what you see, you can sign up for the premium subscription. It gives you access to all their courses and get 20% off your subscription. So give it a try if you haven't. You might surprise yourself. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links in the description. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are helping to keep the lights on around here, forming an awesome community, giving me all kinds of ideas for videos and helping me out. I can't thank them enough. Uh, I got some new names to shout out real quick. We've got Jeffrey Limpert, Adrian Joshua Lee, Don C. Green, Richard Ringsletter, Ringlesletter, uh, Andrew Wilkinson, Joseph Teslick, Jean and Lisa Taylor, Elisa Razor, uh, C. Greg, Shook Samurai, Joe McGillian, The Boz CL, 
Jose Chavez, Claire Heese, Martin, Dayjob351, uh, Stephen Curtis, Tim J. Thomas, and Ben Broderick. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them, get early access to videos, and just be a part of a really awesome community, uh, just go to patreon.com slash answerswithjoe. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, you might check out this video. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, there's also videos down here on the side if you're on YouTube on the, on the computer screen and whatnot that have my face on the thumbnails. You can check those out. And if you like them, I do invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. Thank you guys so much for watching. Go out there and have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe. And I'll see you next Monday. <laughs> Love you guys. Take care.